For those of you who don't know me, my name's Ron Ashtiani. Um, I've worked in the games industry now, what, 24 years, I think it is this year. Um, it's a life sentence. Uh, <laughs> no, it's been good. Um, and I started off um, as an artist and uh, a lead artist and an art director. Uh, and the first 10, 10 years of my career was spent working on you know, original PlayStation. I actually started on Sega Saturn, but the game didn't make it. Um, and yeah, that dates me quite sufficiently to, to say I worked on a Sega Saturn game. Um, and through that first 10 years, I learned my craft. I worked on some really good IPs. I helped develop new IP and I helped um, to further licensed IP products. And I found myself in 2009 uh, in the role of head of art at Midway Games uh, here in the UK. And it was at the time a dream job. Um, but unfortunately, uh, due to the financial crisis, Midway Games went bust. And um, I did what all artists do best when they find out they've lost their jobs. I buggered off to the pub and I took a bunch of people with me that I thought would be really good um, to work with in the future and applied them with loads and loads of beers. And I said, look, I want to start a new studio. Um, I don't want to make games anymore. I love games. But at the time, you have to bear in mind, 2009, the games industry was really unstable. It isn't like what it, what it is now where, you know, there's more work than there are people. Uh, it was definitely unstable. And I said to the guys, look, I want to I want to build a studio with really top notch artists. And we're going to focus on working on games. But we're also going to work on TV and film. And we're going to be, you know, a, a creative powerhouse. And everyone was like, yay, this is amazing because they're all pissed. And we <laughs> we uh, started um, Atom Hawk. Um, but, you know, our first day in the office wasn't quite uh, why I'd sold them in the pub. Uh, we were in this tiny sweaty room in the middle of August. Uh, we had bars on the windows that you couldn't open. We had um, this big Victorian radiator at the end of the room that you couldn't turn off even in the middle of August. And me fancying myself as a great leader, I said, don't worry guys, I'll sit next to the radiator. I'll take one for the team. And Colin, the other chap there by the radiator is South African, so he didn't care anyway. He was, he, he was actually at home next to the radiator. Um, but the biggest thing was, look how happy we were. We were, we were overjoyed because we were starting out on a new journey together and we were masters of our own destiny, which is which is a really important thing. Um, so, I mean, we were more successful than I think any of us could have possibly imagined, actually, in that first year. We, we worked on all of these projects in year one, uh, which was amazing. We, we put out so much work. I look back at the amount of work we put out for a really small team and we were prolific. You know, uh, I, I don't know what, what was going on. Um, but we worked on all of this stuff. Um, and then I think it was like 2000, end of 2011, um, Marvel came knocking on our door. Um, I would love to say that that was some incredible feat of salesmanship. Um, but actually, the I just got an email, a random email one day from, you know, Charlie Wood at yahoo.com or whatever it was saying, hey, Ron, uh, love your studio's work could you come down to Shepparton uh, and we'll have a chat about a movie I'm making? Now, at the time, I didn't know it was Marvel. Um, I took a gamble. I went to Shepparton. Frankly, I thought I, I could very well get there and find there's nobody there and somebody's had me on. Um, but actually, when I got there, it was the real deal. You know, um, the, I was so skeptical that it was really Marvel that I actually uh, said to Charlie at the time, could you just get someone from Marvel to send me an email just to sort of confirm things? Because... I didn't quite believe it. You know, we were two years into the business and already we were working on these movies. But anyway, we started working on, on Thor Dark World. Um, the team grew significantly. Uh, I mean, we started with four people and I think by July 2012, we were nearly 20 people. Um, so it grew, grew quite a bit. Um, and, you know, we worked with Marvel from 2011 to 2015 and then um, after that, we worked on a, a bunch of other projects. I mean, Atom Hawk grew and grew off the back of that. And I think um, I ran that company for 10 years as CEO. And um, I think we worked on over 30 different projects, um, four movies. And by the time I left, we got 45 staff. So it was a fairly sizable studio um, before I sold it. Um, so what about art? Enough about me. What about art? Well, firstly, I just want to talk a little bit about the motivations in art, because it, it kind of ties into these these projects that I've worked on. 
I tend to think of art as being a form of communication, um, particularly commercial art. You know, when you make art for yourself, there's all sorts of emotional components to it. But when you make art commercially, it's usually because there's a goal that the art needs to achieve or the project needs to achieve and the art is illustrating that. Um, you need to think about who the art is going to influence. So that's your, you know, whether it's your teammates, are you making this art to inform a game team, how to make the game, or is it for public consumption? Um, you need to think about how you're going to make the art and also what's the quality bar needed to hit that hit that quality point. And just to give you some ideas, so, you know, art being used to tell a story, you know, illustrate the through a storyboard or through key beats, um, art being used to sell a product, you know. Um, I think whenever you create art to sell a product, you're almost trying to do everything in one image. You're trying to sell the experience. You're trying to sell the the, the sort of ownership journey. You know, how cool am I going to be when I own this product? And, and there's all sorts of things that go into, into marketing art. Um, is it about sort of key features in a game? You know, um, it's quite common these days to, to, to concept up the, the sort of almost like the, the ideal of what this gameplay feature is going to look like. Um, is it art for a 3D asset? I mean, you know, in these stills, you can see how we went from a sketch through to slightly more refined sketches, a little bit of exploration on movement to a concept. And then the model ends up in a movie and it's used throughout the movie in all sorts of different frames. Um, and the, the key thing about the art direction there is that the art direction baton is being passed from team to team because we might have developed the concept for this particular asset in Thor 2, but then it was handed over to Framestore and Framestore then have to build it and they have to animate it and, and so on and so forth. And what was really interesting about working on the Marvel uh, projects was that none of these different sections were connected together. So, you know, I might uh, direct the concept work for the, the original design and then an art director at Framestore takes it over and all he has is my sketches. He's never met me. He's, he's never, well, my sketches, my team sketches. He's never met me. Uh, and so, so he has to interpret it in his own way. We also have to think about game design. You know, sometimes art is used to communicate a concept. Uh, from a game design point of view. Um, but no matter how you're doing the the art and what it's for, you're all going through this creative process, you know, and and I think the the sort of perfect creative process is this. You know, this is this is if you know if you're writing a textbook on on the creative process, that this is how you'd write it down. You know, the, the idea comes into your head, you solve the problem you know, you, you go through multiple ideas, you work, go through multiple design sort of iterations, you get feedback and, and you, you finish the job. And, and yeah, it's great. But the truth of it is, you're actually going through this creative process here, where you're saying, you know, this is going to be really awesome. I'm really pumped about this concept. And then you're going, oh, this is a bit tricky. There's some problems in this. And then you start to think, oh, God, this is actually going to be shit. And also you start to think maybe you're shit and, and you can't do it. And as an art director, you you've got to manage this flow because your whole team is going through this arc of like sort of a emotional roller coaster, but you're also going through it, but you, you never show the guys that you're going through it. So, so the team are kind of having their own little sort of crisis uh, of confidence and you're also secret having your crisis of confidence, but you just got to power through. Um, okay. So designing art for games versus film. So what I want to talk about here is just a little bit of the, the differences, you know, and why why those differences exist. So firstly, from a production timescale point of view, um, there is this, you know, quite a big difference between a game and a film. Um, you know, with an indie game, you've got a very small team. You're probably even running just one or two concept artists and you can kind of freestyle it. You can, you can, you know, you're all working together. If you decide to change a feature, you can do that um, and, and it's all good. And then on a console game, you might have five to 10 concept artists, you know, on a decent size, size project. And again, you know, there's a good chunk of time spent freestyling and just kind of working out a few different ideas. And as you know, game features get cut, game features get added. So you, you've got a fair bit of flexibility. Um, one art director is more than enough to manage that, that pipeline. Um, when you get onto a movie, they're spending 
two, three times the money that a game would cost in half the time. And um, there are some big constraints. You know, obviously they're, they're dealing with a narrative by the script and you can't just chop big chunks out of a script if, if you start running out of time. So with a game, you know, you can remove a feature if you decide you want to bring the game in a bit early. But with a film, you can't chop chunks out of it. I mean, they do, but nothing to the level that you can with a game. Um, and the actors are booked in maybe two, three years in advance. You know, if you think about some of the big names, you, you can't sort of tell them, you know, we'll bring you in when we're ready. You have to you have to book a slot with them. And there are big penalties for, for changing that slot. So so the movie studios tend to say, OK, filming is going to be here. We've booked Gwyneth Paltrow. We've booked, you know, um, all these different people. And then and then production has to sort of be built backwards from that point. And that means that concept art and set building has to happen in multiple different threads. And so you often find that in a movie, there are several art directors, basically. Um, so the setup in a, in, a, in a movie studio sort of you know, creative flow is you would have uh, the IP owner, which you know, might be Marvel themselves. Um, and then you'd have a production designer who really is like the most senior art director. That's what they do. They're the, they're the person who keeps the whole symphony playing together, the whole orchestra working in, in one go. And then they have a bunch of art directors working for them. Um, and then you have the art team. You don't really have leads as such. I mean, you might have a modeling lead who is a technical excellence at, when it comes to building models, but you wouldn't have a lead in the traditional way that you would in, in the games industry. Um, in games, obviously, the art director is kind of the next person down from the IP holder or the game director, and then you have a bunch of leads. So so I use the term production designer, art director interchangeably in this talk because of that. In games, we have to cater to different hardware. We have to deal with different screens. We have to deal with different platforms. And that governs the art style that we, we come up with for that project. Um, we also have to deal with a fully immersive 3D world, which also, you know, can be um, can be quite tricky. You know, you, you're having to design everything, and the player could go anywhere. So, so you've got to you've got to do a really good job of you know the backs of things and the undersides of things, just in case the player goes there. I mean, to give you an example of that, um, this is a concept from a cockpit for Eve Valkyrie. Um, and me and my team worked on these concepts. Now, E Valkyrie is a VR game. So even though you're playing just what's on the screen like this, the player could decide to look down the back of their chair or they could decide to even look under the chair. Uh, and, and so we ended up having to design everything. Um, again, going back to gameplay constraints, you know, sometimes you have to design things that are, are sort of not even a visual problem. They're a, a gameplay problem somebody has to visualize that gameplay problem to be able to, for everyone to be able to understand it. Um, in games, we also can't always control the, the composition of an image. So, so if you think about it, if the camera is free and people can move the screen anywhere, how can you guarantee that they're going to see the, the vista that you want them to see exactly as you planned? And, you know, we've got some little tricks in games like, you know, constraining the player's position so that we can force uh, a specific view of the world from that point, but we, we can't always guarantee it. Um, and the other sort of big difference about production in games is this iterative process. You know, we in games, we tend to, like, I suppose using the, the even the way we make games, you know, you start with a prototype, you do a vertical slice, you do an alpha, a beta, and it's, it's almost like we're always, we're, designing the whole thing and we're detailing it in different layers. To, uh, so we're sort of blocking everything out and refining it as we go. In movies, we can design everything to camera. And by that, I mean, in a concept, if, if we don't see it, we don't need to design it. And that was quite a big, uh, almost quite a liberating kind of thing, actually working on, on a movie for the first time. Because suddenly you're like, well, as long as it looks good to the camera, who cares? You know, we, we've won. Um, the downside is that the pace at which they want to work is phenomenal. I mean, God, like, like that image that you're seeing on screen there from Guardians of the Galaxy, that was a day's work. 
and we were producing images like that every single day uh, and it was just exhausting and I think the guys didn't even know they could do art at that spe- at that pace until we, we started working with Marvel it was it was incredible um, most of the images you pre- produce on a movie are related to the story so it's very rare that you do a little breakout of an object it's always like you know what could this frame look like what could this key beat in the story look like um, and also you, you're dealing with um, a hybrid of real world locations and and then CG overlays. So by that, I mean the the location scouting crew will go out uh, and they'll say, OK, there's a farmhouse. This is Hawkeye's uh, farmhouse from uh, Avengers Age of Ultron. So so they would say, OK, in the script, it describes an idyllic American home, you know, a farmhouse. So they'll go out and they'll find one or they'll find six of them. And then those photos will be passed back to the concept team and the concept team will have to work these photographs up to integrate all of the thing, other things that are supposed to be in the script. So, for example, in this particular one on the left, um, I think the house already existed, but the barn didn't exist. So we had to add the barn and stuff like that. Um, quite often as well in movies, you're you're just dealing with with light and mood and atmosphere. Uh, if you think about something like the Aliens films and how quite often you're just seeing loads of smoke and mist and, and glowing green lights and then the xenomorph comes out from the smoke. A lot of, a lot of movie work is smoke and mirrors, literally. And, uh, and the concept side of it is, is sometimes not even detailed at all. It's, it's just, you know, evoke a kind of a vibe, if you know what I mean. And, and then the VFX guys will take a concept like this and they'll make it work. So they don't need any more than that from us. Um, going back to the pace of work though god they love they love rapid idea generation and, and I think this is kind of unique to Marvel um, I think Marvel is so they're so I'm, I'm going to say they're so um, cash rich time poor that the way they tend to design things is they can't afford for anything to be delayed they've got, they've got they're making so many movies you know they're all on a production schedule so rather than say show us a couple of designs for a Milano next Friday. They'll say, show us as many designs as you can possibly do with 10 artists. And you'll, you'll go in and, and have a big wall with all of these printed off. And the, the director will sort of sit there with the production designer and go, yeah, I really like that one. And that will be the one that ends up in the movie. Um, if they don't like any of them, you know you're in big trouble because you've just spent probably 20 or 30 grand designing spaceships in a, in a week's stint, which is, uh, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, and to just sort of explain uh, that process, you know, they kind of like to work in this, in this method of what I would call a convergence funnel. So if you think about how we work in games in this iterative way where it's come up with the stick man version of this and then polish and polish and polish and polish until you end up with a final character, um, with the convergence funnel method, it's just chuck 10 ideas, 20 ideas, maybe 100 ideas. I mean, um, for the Milano spacecraft in Guardians of the Galaxy, we did 162 versions of the Milano. So when you think about the convergence funnel, it's a big funnel for something like that. And, and at each step, we're refining it and refining it down. But when you do get to that final point, um, you're then producing really detailed schematics. Uh, because those detailed schematics, um, to give you an idea of scale, the original uh, piece of concept that you're seeing on the screen here, if you were to print it out, it would be about 12 feet high. So that's how detailed it is. Every single rivet, every single hinge. And it's because um, when you pass this on to the set building crew, they're going to build something like this out of that uh, that concept. And... Um, I mean, this is, this was phenomenal. You know, I went, we designed, uh, this is a little mining sort of shuttle from Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, you might remember them. There's a battle and they're all flying around in these little bubble craft. And I went to Comic-Con 2014 and, uh, and, and there it was, you know, and nobody told me it was there. You know, Marvel just said, come to our stand, you know, just to say hi. And I came to their stand and, th- and this is what was there. And it was, it was just like, you know, it was, a, it was a dream come true seeing it for real. 
but they they use like MDF, they use plaster, they use latex, they build molds. Um, they'll use uh, 3D printing these days quite a bit, you know, some quite large scale 3D printers. And the, the canopy for the Milano craft, um, because it's like a big glass dome with, with a metal ring around it, um, they, I think they 3D printed the metal frame for that of aluminium. And I was told that the only people who could do that at the time was BMW. So I think BMW printed the the 3D canopy section for the for the actual, you know, um, prop in in on stage. Okay, so finding a style. Well, I mean, we all work in games. We're all used to working up styles and trying to figure them out. And I think that you know, normally in games, you're always thinking about what your target audience is. You're thinking about is it is it kids? Is it teens? Is it hardcore gamers? You know. Is it these guys? You know, plenty of games these days are aiming at a different market. But when working with Marvel, you're making games for these guys. You're making games for f- hardcore fans, you know, and uh, and they don't miss a trick. There's so many little Easter eggs in these Marvel movies. There's so many little tie-ins. And if you get one thing wrong, someone somewhere on Reddit will be like, well, did you see that, you know, in, in version three of Iron Man, they got this wrong. And, and so you've, you've got to become an absolute buff on the Marvel Universe and you've got to become get there very quickly. And I would say that one of the hardest things about working on Thor 2 and Avengers was was this bit, you know, getting fully clued up on the, the Marvel Universe. Um, so in games, you might do things like this in early stylization exploration. You, you're sort of taking a concept and you're pushing it to see how abstract you want to go versus how realistic... And um, in films, that there wasn't really any of, of that kind of work. But what there was was a lot of, of reference gathering. And uh, I'll explain why in a minute. So just folders on folders of cool reference, weird little like snippets of an outfit, not even a full outfit, but just like the scales on this armor or, you know, the, the look of a certain lighting sort of construct there. Um, and it's because they do a lot of, they do a lot of style blending in movies, um, which is something we do in games as well, but they, they do it a lot in, in movies. So to give you an example, um, you take the story of the Holy Bible, you know, and by that I mean one person who will come and sort of be our savior and redeem us all um, and an oppressive sort of fascist regime and uh, the space race. And you end up with, with Star Wars. And um, and this is a, you know, in Star Wars contained multiple threads like this. So if you look at Han Solo, Han Solo is a cowboy. You know, uh, if you look at all of the different characters, they all have their own sort of um, uh, blends going on between them. And then, you know, looking at, looking at games, you know, um, well, for a start on the left-hand side here, you've got some examples of, of what H.R. Geiger did with his blending of styles, where he's taking, um, you know, sort of biology and gothic architecture and mechanical engineering and combining it together into his style which was made famous in aliens um, and on the right hand side that's a building from gears of war and you can see how um, the artists uh, took gothic architecture and mixed it in with industrial design and biology and I, the, there's no coincidence there that there's quite a bit of hr geiger in that building um, but you can see how they took stylistic influences and blended them. So, so on the movie side of things, there's a lot of trying to categorize um, reference points, trying to understand what it is about those reference points that we want to extract and use, um, and lots of kind of rangefinder work where we're saying, okay, you know, if this is at this end of a spectrum and this is at the other end of the spectrum, where's our sweet spot? so that we can then communicate that to the larger team. So bringing it all together, finally get to talk about Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, so James Gunn's original vision was that, you know, this statement here, you know, I've always loved space epics or space operas or space adventures as long as I can remember. And this was the chance to make one for today's audience. Guardians of the Galaxy would be about color and life and in your face, unrepentant over the top color or well, slightly change that but you can see where his vision was going and particularly when you look at the the original comics um 
I mean, I've got to be honest, when they when they first said, we want you to work on Guardians of the Galaxy, we were still at the end of Thor 2. And we were like, Guardians of the Galaxy, we've never heard of it. And we started doing a bit of Google research and it was like, ah, this looks pretty pretty crap, to be honest. Like, this isn't a big Marvel IP. No one's heard of it. Um, you know, this isn't, this isn't, maybe this isn't going to be that good. And what really sort of got us interested was when they said, we're going to completely reimagine this. Uh, it's going to be a fresh start and a blank canvas and obviously to artists being told you've got a fresh start is is fantastic so we could we could sort of do what we wanted with it um there were some key reference points that came from from uh, the production designer Charles Wood um he while well, he and James Gunn were talking a lot about Barbarella and Fantastic Voyage Forbidden Planet these kind of like 1960s pulp sci-fi um uh, kind of films and how they didn't take themselves too seriously, and I think that that really came through in in Guardians of the Galaxy. You know, it was a it was a fun movie. Um, but rather than take on this kind of sixties vibe, they wanted to lift the color and the light heartedness from the sixties, but then tie it in with the eighties kind of uh, vibe that I think was really epitomized with this uh, this old Walkman. Um, and I actually had this Walkman when I was a kid, and it was awesome. It was like if you had this, you were the coolest kid ever. Um, and I remember it being a real, you know, like, you know, when your parents buy you something that you didn't expect them to actually buy you and you get something, you get it and you're like, oh my God, I'm so cool. Um, it was great. Um, so, so, and you'll see later on how we managed to weave this Sony Walkman into, into some of the artwork uh, that we did for the movie. We started out, it was end of Thor 2. They said, could you just work up some, some images? And uh, we had a great artist on the team called Tim Hill. Tim, uh, just almost in an afternoon, knocked out this image. And he also knocked out this one. Uh, and these are like Quill's abduction. And um, what they gave us was a little bit of script, just saying, you know, this is, this is the piece that we want you to, to visualize. And, uh, and Tim put these together. And then um, they used them to announce the movie. Uh, I think we were all a bit like, oh God, I wish we'd spent a bit more time on those images. And um, this is another one of Tim's pieces. Uh, and we got a very nice tweet from James Gunn about this particular image, uh, where he said that this work inspired the, the Ronan and Thanos scene in Sanctuary. And then going on to that sort of style blending. So we did, we did, I think, probably 70% of the spaceships in Guardians of the Galaxy. And we probably did about 20% of the, the locations. Um, so talking about the Milano spacecraft first, because the Milano was kind of like the Millennium Falcon of the, the Guardians of the Galaxy universe. And talking about blending styles, I mean, we were looking at, at references from particularly the 1940s and 50s, you know, looking at, at the, the early stages of the jet age, um, looking at 1950s cars, looking at, you know, World War II, and taking a lot of these kind of very fluid forms that, you know, aerodynamics and sort of jet age stuff, and then mixing it with modern day materials, you know, carbon fiber, lightweight alloys, 3D printing, um, and pulling the, the sort of classic design aesthetics with modern materials to, to start designing the Milano. Um, these concepts were done by a, a really amazing artist called Roberto Castro. If you look him up online, he worked on, uh, after he left Atomwalk, he went on to work on Star Wars and he went to work on so many, you know, really amazing projects. Such a talented guy. Um, there's a few tutorials, I think, online as well about, um, they're on the Atomhawk uh, YouTube site about how we, the process we use to develop these. Um, so yeah, so, you know, like I say, we did 160, 60 odd versions of this spacecraft. I'll just give you a few here. Um, you know, taking loads of different shapes. I love this one. You know, I, I think this one actually um, ended up being used, well, a version of this ended up being used for uh, the Space Pirates ship. I can't remember, it's Yondu, Yondu's ship we used this for. Um, and as you can see, we, we did so many versions of this uh, to eventually end up with the, the final Milano. And you might recognize the blue and the orange color scheme, which we, we lifted from the, uh, the, the Sony Walkman. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it, it made everybody happy, which is great. 
this is that th that canopy I was talking about that I think was 3D printed in aluminium. Um, they actually built this this spacecraft as a physical set, uh, and one one of the times we went down to Shepparton to see the see the team and see how it was going, uh, they kind of kept it a little bit hush and said, you know, come over here and have a look at this, and and they showed us uh, particularly the interior that they'd done from from this craft, and it was it was amazing. You know, they'd used um, proper uh, automotive leather seat trimmers that like these guys with trimmed seats for Bentley and stuff like that and they'd done all the the quilting in the seats and oh, I was just sublime you know to see almost brought a little tear to my eye at the time um, but it was incredible to see the detail um, and you know I think there's a big difference as well in movies between sets they know they're going to just trash at the end of the the shoot and sets that they're going to keep and use in multiple movies so, you know, Marvel being Marvel, they knew full well that they were going to do various, you know, future Guardians of the Galaxy movies and that this ship was going to appear in in a number of other things. I mean, I think the Milano is also in um, one of the... Is it in Endgame? I think it features in Endgame as well. Um, so when they built this set, they put a lot of love and attention into it and and designed it in a way that it could be modularly sort of dismantled and packed away so that they could bring it out for, for future productions. Um, we also worked on Dark Aster, which uh, which is the big, um, you know, Ronan's sort of uh, baddie spaceship, and we wanted it to have this kind of prehistoric feel, like like it's older than you know our civilization by a long way. And again, this is Tim Hill working on this particular design. Um, we started off looking at, you know, sort of almost like um, mammoth kind of. Like uh, like mummified mammoths and their bone structure, and could we do something that was almost dinosaur-like? And, and we felt it was maybe too too literal. And then we moved on to this kind of sea creature sort of design, where maybe maybe the ship is partially organic, partially um, uh, mechanical. Um, but again, you know, wasn't quite right. Kind of had a slightly sort of fishy vibe going on to it. Um, and then we came up with this one, which. I loved, Tim loved, everybody loved. But then uh, this was about the same time that Prometheus came out and it, we all felt that actually it was too close to the Prometheus. You know, the, the famous rolling ship that Charlize Theron can't get out of the way of even though she could just step to the side and prevent it from running her over. Um, and then we got into the real weird stuff. And what I would say, definitely the, the Marvel process was kind of to exhaust the artist's preconceptions so by that i mean you would do so many versions that all of the really obvious stuff would would you do in the first sort of five five images and then once you were exhausted for ideas you would start going to some really weird places um and and that kind of then created some very interesting ideas and um the slide isn't in this deck but there's one where i'll show you i'll show you show people what charlie sent sent me one morning Charlie sent me a picture of the shower head from his shower room was like, what if we did something that was like this shower head? And, and, uh, and that kind of then spawned um, some of these designs where it was more like a kind of a bar for the spacecraft with a head on the end. Um, and we used various different, you know, um, beard trimmers and shower heads and things like that as reference to create some of these designs. Um, this one always, always reminded me a little bit of the, the alien spacecraft in uh, Star Trek Undiscovered Country, you know, where they have the whales, um, the the big sort of bar-like thing that's trying to communicate with the whales on the planet. But in the end, uh, we settled on uh, this design. And mainly because when it's in motion, this design is all rotating, almost like transforming as it moves through the, the sky. So it had a very alien tech kind of uh, propulsion method which worked very well on screen and then we also worked on um, uh, oh what was it called and we said and they said Azkaban it's not Azkaban it's, it's the name of the um, oh anyway it has a name I can't remember what it is <laughs> um, but the we worked on the prison and the prison you know we started off with all sorts of crazy designs uh, and this particular design um, actually looks a lot like Alcatraz. 
And that was deliberate. We felt that some of the more abstract designs didn't sell the sort of prisonness of the of the design. And so by making it look a bit like Alcatraz, we sort of created something new but familiar. And that that new but familiar angle is is something in in art direction that that for me keeps sort of ringing true because I think when you design something truly unique, sometimes you end up with that term, they were ahead of their time, which basically means that it was a cool design, but nobody got it when it came out and we started to appreciate it later. Um, and it can be better in a movie where you're just going to see something very quickly on screen to go with something that, that kind of is, is more familiar. Um, so, you know, we did, we did so much. I mean, we designed the, the prison itself. We designed the Nova transporter that docks with the prison. And you can see the detail that we went into to design this, uh, this structure that kind of docks with the spacecraft. And this particular uh, image, uh, it was on screen for less than three seconds, I think. So you, <laughs> it, was, it was phenomenal, you know, putting all of this effort into something and then watching it and going, wait for it, wait for it. There you go. And then it was, oh, it's gone. Oh, that was it. You know, months worth of work, uh, you know, on screen. Um, one of the other big ones that we spent a lot of time on was the, the inside of the prison. And, um, you know, we did numerous concepts for what it could look like. Um, and then when they came to actually build it, you see this particular set, there was lots of, of moments on screen with the actors. And so it made total sense to build it as a, as a physical location. So they actually built it up to, you can just about see it there. I think it was three stories they built it up to um, as a physical set. And I went and stood on the, on, on the set and had a look around. It was phenomenal, all made out of steel. Must have been thousands of you know, kilos of steel involved in this. Um, and then the rest of it, they had a big sort of green screen uh, at the top of the set and they added um, all of the floors above using using green screen um so so our our job was to concept the whole thing and then and then their job was to divide it divide it up and work out how they were going to put it together um and the detail again you know um we we have several scenes where we see the 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 sort of you know the guardians of the galaxy team imprisoned in their cell and so a lot of sort of detail had to go into these, the designs of the doors and how the doors would release and unfold and, and you know, show, uh, show how it all worked basically. Um, and again, like on screen for maybe two seconds, but uh, the detail had to be there because it's close to the camera. Um, we worked on Nowhere. This was, this was probably my favorite environment that we worked on for that particular movie because nowhere is the coolest thing in the world it's basically a giant head of uh, a prehistoric sort of humongous android type thing um, but people have created a civilization inside the head and they're extracting the spinal fluid which has a value so they're like mining the inside of this head for its uh, its special properties and it, it features in the comics um, it also strangely uh, looks a lot like Ultron, which was something that we we queried a lot. Why is why is the design of Nowhere um, very similar to Ultron? I think there was a little Easter egg intention in that. Um, so we designed uh, the the look of, of this particular location. We almost designed it like a bunch of storyboards as well. So we wanted to show how the ship would, you know, how you would see it in the opening shot, how you would then fly into it. And then once you've flown into it, what the interior looks like and reference points, the interior is ancient. So we're talking about, uh, they've been mining this spinal fluid for maybe two or 3000 years. So we needed to think about how layers of, um, history had built up inside, uh, the head of nowhere and, and how, how it had kind of like evolved over time. So we were looking at, you know, um, ancient sort of sites, but also evolving, um, countries where they have sort of heavy industry, but it's not all very clean and kind of technological like it is in this country, you know, so, so looking at, you know, China and Indonesia and places like that. 
And then we produced a bunch of speed paints that were all about sort of mood and atmosphere and lighting. Um, again, trying to work in that layering of history, um, trying to sort of evoke that, that feeling that this is an ancient place. Um, and then moving on to the bar, the favorite place, the, the, the boot of uh, Jeremiah, I think it was called, or boot of Exitar, I think it ended up being called in the movie. Um, great thing about this was we were mainly designing to camera, so we didn't have to design everything. But when we did design something, we had to do a proper job of it. And to give you an example of that, you might remember in the movie, we see a very brief shot of people gambling at this table in the middle of the, the screen. And we actually had to design the, the table in detail and even think about the rules. And, you know, how does this work? We've got this little rat time kind of creature that gets chased. And then these other sort of killer creatures that have to chase it. And the amount of time it takes the killer to catch the rats determines almost like a roulette wheel. You're sort of guessing how long the time's going to going to be. Um, but we put a lot of effort into that. Um, and then finally, uh, the the collector's sort of um, room of many wares. You know, it's, it's almost like a museum. He's been collecting creatures and artifacts and and all sorts of things. Uh, and this is where they collect the Tesseract from. Um, so uh, originally we sort of saw it as being like the kind of um, natural history museum, you know, it being like a dusty sort of, you know, big cavernous kind of chamber where you've got all of these sort of um, containers in bathed in a kind of golden light, really sort of making the collector, because we didn't want the collector to feel mm -hmm. seedy. We wanted him to almost feel like he was um he was educated you know he's a he's a kind of a you know a connoisseur of these artifacts he just happens to also be a bit of a dodgy guy when it comes to uh, acquiring things from him but up going with a much more traditional kind of sci-fi design to the location it became more like a warehouse with crates full of these artifacts and as you know the collector he's a little bit eccentric but he's not He's not the kind of museum curator that we saw him as being. He ended up being quite a, quite a sort of wheeler dealer. I'm an alligator. I'm a mama papa coming for you. I'm a space invader. I'll be a rock and rolling bitch for you. Keep your mouth shut. Just walk along. Holy...